Welcome to the new normal of Truthside TV. I am Nilantha Ilangamuva. The political crisis in Venezuela is not going to end in near future. Who is the real president in Venezuela? The opposition leader Juan Guaido declared himself as acting president at the beginning of last year. But late President Hugo Chavez's successor, President Nicolas Maduro, did not take kindly to his rival's move, which he condemned as a ploy by the US to oust him. What is exactly happening in Venezuela? My guest today is a founding member of Vente Venezuela. She was elected member of the National Assembly of Venezuela in September 2010 having obtained the highest number of votes of any candidate in the race. However, for her role in civil society, she was accused by the Hugo Chavez government of conspiracy and treason and was prohibited from leaving the country without judicial authorization for several years. On March 2014 she spoke before the Pan- Permanent Council of the Organization of American States after the Republic of Panama yelled its speaking rights so that she could denounce human rights violations in Venezuela. For this reason according to her she was arbitrarily removed from her elected position by the president of the National Assembly. She said it is a gross violation of due process and international customary law. She faces accusation of treason, terrorism and homicide as well as repeated threats of incarceration. But her fight for democracy and freedoms is continuing. Maria Corina Machado is joining by me from her home in Caracas, Venezuela. Welcome to the show. Maria Machado, welcome to the new normal of Truthside TV. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Let's start this discussion with uh, with a bit of your childhood. And I have read a couple of stories about uh, your childhood where you have stated that your childhood was protected from contact with the reality. So what do you mean by that? Well, I I'm I'm the eldest of four daughters and my parents uh, are part of a very large and very close family. So, you know, my parents uh, took good care of us and um and I have to say never ever wanted any of their children to get involved in politics. As as we grew up politicians in Venezuela were truly discredited and and I I thought the last thing I would do in my life was get involved in in politics because I I thought it 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 would mean some kind of compromise my family has always um worked and and invest and 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 and, and love very much Venezuela for many generations but never got involved into politics so uh i was like you know the first time i i i brought to our family uh, and in a time of high risk the the possibility to be exposed uh, to 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 the public so it was a tough decision and and as i said it wasn't what my parents wanted for us yeah but but one of your great uncle was killed in an uprising against Venezuelan dictator Juan Gomez and one of your great grand grandfather was uh, the claim author and in 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 that source in that shows uh, uh, you your family has a sort of uh, political involvement since uh, since many decades ago well yes in the fight for freedom that was at, at the beginning of, of last century uh he was my as you say my great 
uh, Ancom, and um, he was only 24. He was killed, uh, shot in his head. Armando was his name, and and actually he was he was like the love of my of my childhood. I I, I was truly impressed by his testimony. Uh, he fought with other fellow students uh, against the dictatorship Juan Vicente Gomez, and and uh, and he was killed. So he was not a politician, but he was certainly committed to the freedom of his country, and and certainly that's something that you know we have learned uh, from you know our ancestors, and and that I believe that's uh, a responsibility we have. Uh, towards our country. Many people ask me if, if, why I'm not living somewhere else and actually, you know, I could go. But, but I only conceive my life in freedom and in Venezuela. So actually I have no option that to give right. everything I have to liberate Venezuela from this criminal regime that's destroying our nation today. Yeah, and you studied engineering. And then you did job out of uh, Caracas and later on you moved to Caracas and involved with politics. What triggered you to involve with politics, which you never thought at one time in your, in your life? Yeah, that's, that's a tough question. And it was a very hard decision for me because as I say, I'm the oldest of, of four children. And I wanted to prove my father that he didn't need a son to follow his steps. And, um, and, and also I started corporate finance. And at some point I, I, I got married, I was working in the outer part industry. And my, my mother invited me to, to go with her to visit a center for, for abandoned kids. That was back in 1991. And you know, it was just uh, at the, the days before I gave birth. And, and that changed my life. I saw these kids that were almost like in a prison and bad food, no education, no health whatsoever. And I said, I, I have to change this. I, I cannot go back to sleep and, and take care of my kid. So uh, I, I resigned to my job and we created an NGO called Fundación Atenea and we totally transformed the reality of this shelter that had 180 kids. So I, 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 I say, you know, that was a milestone that changed my life because from then on, one thing brought to the other. Then I joined and, and we founded an NGO to, to promote citizenship and, and clean elections. And then, it, you know, I realized I could not, you know, complain about politics endlessly, but I had to, to try to, to change things myself. Yeah, and then you start your NGO to which you receive funds from U.S which came under fire in, in, the, in the country. And uh, talking about the amount that you receive, many, many uh, the ministers in the government say that you are a puppet of the US. Yes, that's true. That's what uh, Hugo Chavez and this corrupt socialist and communist regime say of anyone that dares to speak out. And, and it was many years ago when I realized uh, the degree of, of cruelty that Hugo Chavez and, and, his, and his group was bringing to Venezuela, the way they wanted to divide and polarize our country. And, and they were, you know, the volatiling and the, the democratic institutions. So I started to speak out. No one dared to do that. Uh, uh, and immediately the regime created this huge campaign using all the government media outlets and, and funding to, to destroy my reputation. And they would say exactly that was I was a puppet of, of anyone you can think of uh, from the international community. And I, you know, that I, 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 that kind of blackmail I don't fall into. I just speak out louder. And unfortunately, the results and reality prove I was right. Venezuela is today a totally destroyed country, a country with the highest oil resources in the world, but has 96% of its population living in poverty. We have over 
six million Venezuelan migrating, flying, fleeing the country and uh, all around the world. That, and that represents almost 25% of our population. It's devastating. So uh, more, today more than ever, I'm, I'm uh, persecuted. I've been banned from leaving my country for over six years. I had to take my kids away because send them away because they were threat to their lives. But, uh, but we're fighting and I believe that finally the world has understand what we warned during these 20 years. And I know we are moving ahead and that we will liberate Venezuela. What went wrong in Chavez's presidency? And he ruled the country for so long and many years. And then uh, unfortunately he died in 2013 due to a cancer. And then what is your assessment? What went wrong there with him? Well, uh, the first thing I have to say is that Chavez wasted the biggest opportunity any person, any leader could have in, in Venezuela. When Chavez arrived into power in 1998, he, uh, the, the oil barrel was uh, around $8 a barrel. That was a price. And, but it started growing and growing and it went over $150 a barrel. Imagine that huge amount of money in an oil rich country such as Venezuela. So Chavez could have used that in order to open our markets, to strengthen you know, opportunities for, for all the populations, uh, all the population and the country. What they dedicated is to steal uh, and to rob um, a whole nation they created a network of other socialist and, and criminals regimes uh, called El Foro de Sao Paulo that started to find, uh, to finance, to fund each other throughout our hemisphere. And he decided to go against the independent media, uh, the private sector. They took over many financial uh, institutions, and, and they took over the, 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 the Supreme Court and all the, let's say, the law system. And, and, and finally, what they wanted is to turn Venezuela into a hub of um, the criminal networks of the world. I'm saying drug cartels, guerrillas, and even uh, extremist terrorist groups such as Hezbollah and Hamas that are installed in Venezuelan territory and from Venezuela expand their you know um, business throughout the region and also finance uh, the activities these groups have throughout the world so I believe that this was a well thought project we didn't realize at the beginning the nature of these, um, let's say, liaisons, but we, we, we knew it was certainly an uh, um, authoritarian regime which turned into totalitarian system uh, as, a day, as the years went by. Are there any positive things that you could monitor during his time? Look, when you, it's hard to, to answer that when you are seeing a whole generation of Venezuelan kids growing with hunger with malnutrition. Recently, a uh, 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 nationwide uh, study investigation revealed that 35% of Venezuelan kids under five years old suffer critical malnutrition. Uh, and, and when you see uh, that, uh, as I said, 96% of our population live in poverty, when you see that over 50% of Venezuelan population have to cook with wood, because there's no electricity. Uh, when you see this scarcity of, of oil, of gas, people cannot move from one city to another because there's, there's no gasoline and in, in, a, in an oil rich country. So uh, it's hard to, 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 to bring up good things, but I have to say that all these tensions that Chavez brought among Venezuelans, promoting, you know, hatred and, and division, uh, somehow has also brought uh, a new consciousness of what citizenship is. 
and our responsibility for the well-being of the whole country. And, and, and I have to speak on my own, my own experience. I, I never thought uh, giving my life to public service. And now you see young men and women that are well-educated and that have decided to, to, to take the step and, and, and fight uh, and, and, and dedicate their life as, as politicians, but with honesty, uh, with responsibility, and with mind opens to the ideas that really work. We don't want a an rich state, we want a rich society. And that's something totally different from what we always had. We, in Venezuela, we've always known and only known socialism populism, and militarism. Uh, so it's, it's a unique opportunity to, to present to our country a totally new model of development and of growing, a society growing rich with opportunities for all. So I think this is a, a unique opportunity that we have in our history, and I think will change not only the history of Venezuela, but it will change the history of Latin America. Do you hate socialism? I think that socialism has brought poverty and violence because it takes away the hope, the pride, and incentives for an individuals to, to, to move ahead, to innovate, to even to help each other. I, be, I believe open markets are a cooperative system that give the opportunity for every individual to give the best of its potential to, to, to grow into uh, and develop their talents and to help each other. And, and that's how I see a society working, uh, having individuals that are free and responsible of their actions, but also they have opportunities, uh, uh, equal opportunities for all. And, and, and I think that's the, the, the great transformation Venezuela will see in the near future. And if you go out in Venezuela today and ask my fellow citizens what they think about socialism, well, it's considered a bad, very bad word in Venezuela today. Now there is the dispute, uh, the, who is the president in the country? Who is actually the president in the country? Today, uh, in Venezuela, we have an interim president who is Juan Guaido. He is recognized by over 60 countries around the world. Ben, uh, Nicolás Maduro is taking over, de facto, uh, the, the executive uh, power but it's proven that Nicolás Maduro is not only a criminal, but uh, is no longer president. So um, Venezuelan constitution is very clear. Our article 233 states, when there is a, you know, a vacuum of power, uh, the president of the National Assembly should take over the presidency as an interim presidency, and that's what's uh, taking place right now in our country. So, Maria, you are being uh, one of the top critiques against the socialism, against the former President Chavez and also the president, current President uh, uh, Maduro. What about the sanction against Venezuela by the US and its friend, friendly countries? And let me quote, let me quote one of the report issues by the Center for Economic and Policy Research published about this uh, Venezuelan uh, sanction. They estimated the 40,000 debt and the loss of at least 6 billion in oil exports between 2017 and 2018 because of these sanctions. Don't you think it is, it is injustice and it has to be stopped? Well, I have to say very, several things. First of all, uh, the destruction of the Venezuelan industry, uh, oil industry took place before the sanctions were put in place. Uh, all the specialists in the, uh, in the sector can uh, assure you that over 80% of the decrease in, in uh, inflows, in cash inflows to the to Venezuelan government took place before because the regime um, uh, transformed Petróleos de Venezuela or oil industry into a criminal branch of the activities, of the criminal activities they were doing, first of all. Second, 
Most of the money the regime gets from their activities, legal or illegal, are, uh, are not brought uh, in terms of food or medicine for the country. They are kept into corruption in, in all kinds of accounts, bank accounts around the world where these criminals have billions of dollars for themselves. So this is not money that's coming for the Venezuelan society and the most needed ones. And third, I have to say, look, if we don't bring this criminal mafia out of power, Venezuela will see an escalation of its destruction to another level. It's obvious, this is not a dictatorship, as I said before. This is a criminal organization. Criminal organization that with its links to the Iranian government, the Cuban government, the Russian government, has decided to stay in power no matter what. We've gone through the, um, over 30 electoral processes and through fraud, they have decided to stay in power. So the only way they will be taken out if we build a credible threat with the Venezuelans in the front line, because we know that what we are facing and, and, and what could happen, not only to our, what's left of our country, but to the region, if these criminals stay in place, but also with the support, with the democratic governments of the world that have to understand that it's also their responsibility to stop a genocide that's taking place that's moving forward in Venezuela. You know, there's their responsibility to protect principle that was approved by the United Nations and that, you know, the countries and, and, and governments cannot, you know, look the other way around when this tragedy is taking place in our country. Many times in history, yeah. the oh, forces have come too late. And yeah. I, 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 this should not be the case. Even though you are saying this sanction has a rationality, but the members of the United Nations have condemned sanctions against Venezuela for violating the aspects of the UN Charter. So if I may quote, if I may quote, the UN Charter, the duty of the states to refrain in their international relations from military, political, economic and any other form of coercion aim against the political independence or territorial integrity of any states. But this, uh, the sanctions is clearly violating this, uh, the basic uh, notions of the UN Charter, don't you think so? On the other hand, you have a Grupo de Lima, the Lima group, which has 13 or well, now I think it's 15 countries in the region, in our hemisphere, which are our neighbors, and they all support the strategy of pressure and sanctions upon this regime. These are democratic nations in the Western hemisphere that truly understand the degree of the destruction and the cruelty this regime has imposed in the Venezuelan society, and understand that we need have a transition to democracy and that these criminals simply won't go through a negotiation process or electoral process because they are willing to stay in power no matter what. They don't care that people die. They don't care that citizens flee their country. Actually, they are working in destabilizing the rest of the region. So in the UN uh, community, you know very well there are high interests strong right. interests and there's a lot of resources and a lot of money the maduro and the chavez regime has given around the world to have you know allies or simply people that look the other way around yeah you said that the president maduro is not interested in having negotiations but if you read in i'm pretty much sure you have read his open letter to the people in the united states where he mentions let me call it President Donald Trump also intends to disrupt the noble dialogue initiatives promoted by Uruguay and Mexico with the support of CARICOM for peaceful solutions and dialogue in favor of Venezuela. We know that for the good of Venezuela, we must sit down and talk because to refuse dialogue is to choose the path of force. Keep it in mind the words of John F. Kennedy, he quoted, let us never negotiate out of fear but let us never fear to negotiate. Are those who do not want to dialogue afraid of the truth? This is what the President Maduro said. You know, these criminals and communists are very, very efficient 
in, in taking over democratic tools such as negotiation and dialogue and use it on their own behalf. And they have done it with the support and, and, and the advice of the Cuban regime that has taken power over 60 years, as you know, destroying that society and that country. And uh, every time the regime has felt in these 20 years that there are growing forces pressing for a democratic change, they bring up and call for a dialogue and a negotiation process in order to appease society, in order to stop pressure from abroad. And they have done it, as I said, 13 times. They even, in 2016, managed to bring the Vatican and the Pope as a mediator. And at the end, even the Vatican realized that they were deceived by the regime. They never wanted and ne never considered uh, moving ahead in any uh, negotiation process that would meant uh, uh, um, a change, a true change and a transition to democracy in Venezuela. They only want to gain time and legitimacy. And it's unbelievable that at this point, after they've done it 13 times, there are still individuals that say that they care for human rights and, 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 and fall into this trap. These are all, you know, sham uh, processes, both the elections and the, the call dialogues. And, 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 I know, and I tell you something, the international community knows that. But as I said before, in many spaces there are interests and there are people that are, you know, doing well with the status quo that's killing the Venezuelan people. People not only inside, but also abroad. So we're reaching out. We're reaching out to the free-loving uh, citizens around the world to help us open the eyes of those that probably today say, well, it's not that bad in Venezuela. You know, uh, it's far from me. It's, it has nothing to do with our countries and our economies. It does. It does, because it is a criminal system that is using Venezuelan resources and narco-trafficking networks to, to fund and support uh, criminal networks in other parts of the region, Europe and Asia, uh, that are funding terrorist groups and, and, and besides, you know, destroying at once you know, strong and prosperous nation. But, 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 you know, I don't want to end this interview without giving you a very strong message in terms of what I, how much I trust our people, how much I admire my generation and the generations that come after us. I mean, this regime has been fierce, persecuting us, has damaged and killed young students simply because they go out and, and demand, you know, their rights in the streets. They have separated millions of families uh, and and they have you know put in place terror uh, through they have silenced many journalists they have closed down most of the independent media outlets nonetheless the venezuelan people were standing on our inner feet you know strong and decided to move ahead we will never never surrender and uh, i will tell you that venezuela will be uh, a prosperous, just, and open uh, nation to all. Justice will be brought and, and we will live in, in freedom. In order to get there today, we need a view. We need of every single voice of, you know, democratic loving and freedom loving citizen around the world. Maria Machado, thank you so much for joining us. And it's an honor to have you on our show and we wish you all the best. Stay safe and well. Thank you very much. And I hope that uh, one day, not too far away, I can welcome you to, uh, to a free and liberated Venezuela. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much.